We often talk about sparring being a completely necessary part of our training, right? It, it's the thing that makes the thing go. Uh, because just the drilling, I mean, drilling gives you some movement competency, but it doesn't teach you how to, you know, read the scenario, read your opponent, make a decision, create action, uh, deal with consequences, all of that. All that stuff happens going live, right? The question is, well, what counts as sparring? What, you know, what is sparring in the first place? And we've got a few different things to look at, right? Because, you know, many of us who practice martial arts are practicing Eastern martial arts, which means we actually have to look at the words they use. And then on top of that, you know, we should look at what we mean when we say sparring, right? And how those things converge. So uh, I have some selected definitions here. There are, in fact, others. Uh, but uh, let's let's look at this real quick, right? So just at the top, right? Like the word sparring or, to, you know, spar really is of uncertain origin. There are proposals for like French going back to Latin and then uh, Old English and Germanic origins. It's all uncertain. Uh, but since from the 1400s, it has made, meant to strike or thrust. Uh, so basically just striking, right? Which is funny because like the word boxing just means to hit. In fact, it, we're pretty sure it's also technically of uncertain origin, but it seems fairly plausible that it goes back to uh, a Dutch word, which is just an imitative or onomatopoeic sound to hit, to strike. Um, right so the idea of sparring basically is going live playing for hits but a lot of people will point to japanese martial arts the word kumite right and that's both competition and sparring in class but there's a confounding factor there and that is the fact that there's one step and three step and the other compounding step kumite as well as free kumite well what does kumite mean well it actually means grappling hands and that actually kind of makes sense right because uh Native Japanese martial arts are actually largely grappling oriented, uh, not really striking oriented. And as we all know, you know, Okinawa, the birthplace of karate was by and large using Chinese martial arts as well as whatever uh, native practices had popped up and intermingled with that. Um, and I'm unfamiliar with any specific Japanese language words for sparring. Uh, if that in fact is even something that they uh, used outside of just fighting and competition. Um, there is an argument that there wasn't a lot of free sparring done in traditional martial arts, mostly because well, people were just fighting all the time. And so drilling and making yourself better was actually more important than sparring because you were already getting that experience, whatever that's worth. All right. So just because I've got that French side of things, right? We have the word assault, which you know, literally is just the French assault, which just means to attack. That's actually pretty similar to our word sparring, which means to strike. It's a little more general, right? It's a little less specific, but it works out pretty well. And, and we should make note here that they do actually uh, distinguish assault or sparring from combat or fighting. And they consider competition also sparring because Competition is just sparring competition, right? It's still, they don't look at it as a real fight. Maybe we should do a video on what's a real fight. Um, but we're just looking at practicing the attack. Now, there's a couple other words, right? And, you know, we, Chinese martial arts is incredibly varied and different systems, different lineages may use certain terms over others. Um, we're going to pick one. And then also you may be familiar with the Japanese term randori which like literally, literally translates as taking chaos or disorder or something like that. And again, it is a sparring type exercise where uh, an attacker versus a defender is throwing basically random attacks at the other person and they have to defend themselves. Uh, it's not free sparring in the way that we consider like kickboxing and mixed martial arts uh, or rolling as done in grappling or anything like that, but it's a similar idea, right? It's just an offense defense lopsided, uh, sparring as opposed to a full free spar. And then of course, 
Sanchu, one of the, the old, old standbys. A lot of people will look at Sanchu and go, ah, it's just the old term for Sanda. Other people will say, look, Sanchu was kind of a proto Sanda and the idea of taking yourself out of the formality of your system, out of the rigid structure of your system and practicing freestyle, which is actually kind of the loose translation of Sanchu. But Sanchu is actually pretty close to Randori in the sense that, so Shu is the Mandarin for hand, right? We say Sao in Cantonese. Um, so you'd say San Sao uh, if you're doing a Southern style. Uh, San is pretty much the same. But um, instead of chaos, we have scattered or dispersed. And again, really, that's the same idea of putting something into the randomized uh, chaos of things, right? It, as opposed to something being scripted. That's the difference, right? And uh, hand is hand, right? It's similar to Japanese using kumite, except instead of grappling, it's scattered. And again, it's just the idea of bringing a level of randomization and freestyleness into it. So when we look at all of this, what actually is sparring, right? And most of you at this point, and even before this, are going, well, no shit, Sherlock, it's just going live. Obviously, we're not trying to really, really harm each other, but we're trying to provide enough stress to create some kind of pressure response where a person has to read, make a decision, deal with consequences, and do so with the stress of failure and, you know, getting attacked in return. And yeah, I mean, that's essentially it. But the biggest reason I was thinking about this was I remember a long, long time ago, and this was back in the, the, the late 90s, and I was having one of those, oh, poor me moments, right? I wasn't very good at uh, points barring. I just wasn't the fastest. Um, and I was always kind of the knuckleheaded tough kid that, you know, I'll take one to give one, except in points barring, that doesn't work. You can't do that in points bar. And so I, I was telling my sensei, I was like, I'm, I'm just no good at sparring. I'd rather just practice technique. And he's like, what do you think practicing technique is? It's sparring, right? And what he was referring to was one step. He was referring to kumite. And it just brings up the question, like different people have different ideas of what sparring means. Now, I do have a kind of a problem with considering uh, one steps and, and, and complex scripted reactions as sparring. And kumite doesn't translate as sparring. In fact, like having free kumite, I don't remember what the Japanese is, for, is that jiu kumite, something like that. Um, uh, they have to put that modifier on there because it is a completely different thing as opposed to stepped sparring, right? Or stepped kumite. Ste stepped kumite or stepped grappling hands is my opponent issues an attack and I deliver a response. Still very much in that randori platform of attacker and defender. Whereas free kumite is you're both free agents to act and react as necessary. And you have to put that, that modifier in front of it. So in that sense, I do think my first sensei was wrong. Um, and that's no shade against him. It just means that like he was going by a certain perspective and definition that I, I don't think holds up. But, um, but, but the bigger deal here is that outside of Kumite, all of these kind of have this idea of you are dealing with the randomness, you're dealing with the attack, you're dealing with the, the chaos, you're dealing with the strike or the thrust, right? It's, it, it's not the scripted thing, right? And that's the biggest thing. So can you have sparring that's not just full free sparring all the time? And I guarantee you the answer is yes. And I, I look at Randori as the biggest thing, right? And really you could consider any kind of offense versus defense type sparring, oftentimes what I would call bully drills, it's just randori. And it is, you have an attacker that is free to randomize, it may be constrained, of course, um, but you do have an attacker that is uh, free to kind of choose their method of attack, their angle of attack, their timing of attack. They usually have multiple options of attacks to throw from, and the defender has to play defense. Now you could do, uh, and this is why I use the term bully sparring 
instead of Randori, aside from the fact that I mostly am doing Chinese Western martial arts, despite the fact that Kempo is a Japanese reading Chinese martial arts, it still fits within the Chinese martial arts paradigm. Um, but the idea of the bully drill, of course, is that you know you could you could have an attacking side of it too, and that that could be a thing all its own. Uh, but what is sparring, right? Sparring is introducing that level of randomness, chaos, if you will, a bit of pressure, uh, that read and decision making and dealing with consequences. That's the kind of stuff that makes sparring, and that's the kind of stuff that makes what we do go. Drilling is great. Drilling is necessary because you want that kind of, you want to gain that feel for like what is the idealized positioning and timing and, and it, all of that. The only problem is that only works for whatever partner or opponent you're working on, right? Somebody with different limb lengths, different height, uh, different sense of timing, different sense of angle and all that. All of those subtle changes are going to change. And that's another reason that we need to, one, touch hands with a lot of people and two, go random because there are just so many things that we cannot meticulously uh, account for and parse down in structured training we have to let the kind of organic just flow of things work. So I'm gonna cut this out here and, and, and leave you with that. But keep in mind, whatever form your sparring takes, it really does need to have that kind of randomness and pressure. And it does not have to be knocked down, drag out, hurting each other kind of stuff, of course not. Um, you know, light technical sparring is still sparring. In fact, I think most of your sparring should be technical. I think you should be light enough that you can play bare knuckle without actually leaving deep bruises and especially not any kind of cuts uh, most of the time. I think hard sparring is one of those things you should probably only do a few times a year even because the risk of damage is too high. And like, look, there's no avoiding. You have to go hard sometimes, but going hard sometimes doesn't mean like monthly even. I, I, an injury can set you aside for weeks, months even. And you want to kind of keep those risks as low as possible. However, if you never take it to a hard spot, you're, you're just not going to be prepared for it, right? It's, there's a massive, massive world of difference between hard sparring and competition. There's a massive difference between that and a real fight. But certainly, if you never go hard in sparring, you'll never be prepared for the real thing. But it is a risky proposition, and you can only afford to do that sometimes. I honestly, you know, quarterly maybe, right? And even then, that might be asking a little bit much because you consider that most people doing martial arts are doing it recreationally and they're not doing it to become proper fighters. Uh, even quarterly might be asking a bit much of them, but look, twice a year at the least, right? But the point is, you got to have that randomness. All right. I said I was going to cut it off and then I kept on talking. So now I'm done. I will talk to you guys later. Good journey. <laughs>